There we go. I think I'm recording now. There we go. All right, so we're going to continue on with classes today um, and through the rest of the quarter pretty much. This is a, a major part of object-oriented programming. So yesterday we talked about the initialized method and how that's a special method that's called whenever you create a new uh, object. So we wrote that. We wrote out a little square class here. Make it bigger. And when we called a new method, that's that's the the method that actually gets called inside of this is initialize. And I know that's a little confusing. You would think that this would be called initialize and this would be called initialize, or this would be new and this would be new. But that's not the case. Um, this is a uh, a keyword definition that has to be called initialize if you want to pass things into your object as you create it, into your class. And so we did that here. We created a new square, and the 10 gets passed into the variable side length here. And then we store that as what type of variable? What is this called with the at sign? Do you remember? An instance variable. Very good. That's an instance variable, which means that it's specific and it's global to inside of this class. Everything inside of this class can access this data. It's a property of this square. So each, each square has its own data. Each square ha might have a different side length associated with it. So when we create a new square, these can all be different. We did that yesterday when we had a 10 and a 20 and we ran this and we saw that they had different data points, and they were indeed different objects because the memory locations are different, these IDs of where that square is. So that's why they're called instance, because this is a different instance of the square class than this one. They're two different uh, cups that came off the assembly line based on the square blueprint, or the cup blueprint, remember that? So. That's why they're called instance variables. They're local or global to just this instance of that square. All right, so any questions on that? It's hard for me to, to know which screen I'm looking at here. All right, so they're available within the scope of the particular instance of the object. So these are some computer science -y terms you have to understand. Instance is the object that was created from the class, the actual object itself. So in this case, the my square is an instance of the square class. Your square is an instance. It's an object created from the uh, square class, a separate object. And the, this is called, when I create a new instance from a class, that's called instantiation. There's another big word for you. And that's instantiation creates an instance. So those, go to, those two words go together. Instantiate. It's a constructor, right. This is the constructor. In, if you were in like C, uh, C++ anyway, I'm not sure in C Sharp if they call it a constructor. But in C++, this would be called the constructor for that. Yep. Good. So let's move on. Um, we talked about why we use classes uh, to, to create real-world objects. Um, we're trying to create a computer representation of a person or a file or boxes, or shapes, or animals, and we'll, we'll do all kinds of these things this quarter. Um, but we've, we've used classes when we create uh, file objects. When we open a file, we use the file.open, and that has a, a capital F. Remember that it had to be a capital F? That's why it's using the class called file, and the method in that file called open to get at some files on the disk. So that's a class that has all kinds of methods associated with it, just like the string class and the hash class. So once we have the, let's see, where was I? Once we have the object, 
uh, we need to be able to save or change the data or the attributes of that object, and we need to retrieve the data from that object. And to do that, we have these, this concept of a getter and a setter. This is, uh, this is common across multiple languages, not just Ruby. But it, it allows us, a getter obviously allows us to retrieve a value from the object, and a setter allows us to change the value of an object. So let's, let's, uh, let's write a getter to get back the length of our square. All right, so because right now there's no way I can look at this variable. I can't see what that is. It's inside of the class. Uh, the only way I saw it was when I did an inspect. But I can't do something like this. I can't say, uh, print out what is the size of my square. I can't say, what is the size of the square dot side length. That doesn't work. That will that should crash. It would be really bad if it doesn't. Uh, it says, undefined method side length. Well, I have this, this value, this instance variable. How do I get that data out? Maybe I want to look at that. Maybe I want to see that, use it in a calculation outside the class. And to do that, we use what they call a getter method. And so we're going to define a new method. And typically, we can call this whatever I want. I could call it Dave and have it return the value of my side length. All right, so then that method now is available to my object. And I can say, instead of uh, side length, I can say print out my square dot Dave. And it prints out um, 10, which is the value of that squares, that particular instance's uh, side length. And I could say puts uh, your square dot Dave. And what do you think that will print? 20. 20, okay, good. So I get 10 and 20. Now, Dave obviously isn't very descriptive, uh, but it did get the value of the side length out of the class. I could see the value. I could, I could do something with that. So typically, by convention, we make these getters the same name as the property. It, doesn't that make sense? If I want to see the side length, I call my method side length. So instead of Dave, I'm going to call it side length. That just makes more sense, doesn't it? So now I can change this to side length. And notice how IntelliSense here automatically knows that I have a new method in my class. And it populates this little uh, IntelliSense. And I can say side length. So this method now is just going to return the value of that instance variable. Seems like a lot of work to get to that. And you'll see some shortcuts later. But this is, uh, this is convention that we write a getter to get at the values inside of here. Now, we don't have to write getters for every value. There might be some private information that the square has, and we'll talk about that later, that you might not want to expose. You might not want people to see that, that value. All right, so any questions on writing a getter? Let's talk about this. Uh, all we do is define a method that returns a value of the attribute in question. So we're returning the value of this instance variable. And remember, it has to have the at sign on it. That becomes part of that variable name now. That distinguishes it as an instance variable. And note, I don't have any scoping issues here. That variable, once I define it as an instance variable, is global throughout the entire class inside of here. Right? Everybody understand that scoping? Any questions? All right, let's, uh, before we write a, a, a setter, uh, let's write another method. Maybe we want to have our class automatically calculate the perimeter of the square in question. All right, so let's write a new method and we'll call it perimeter. So what what defines, I know this is math, it's not logic, but what is, uh, what would you define the perimeter of a square to be? Right, it's the side length times four. It's the, if I were to 
walk around the square, it's how long, how the distance is around the square. So if I start at one corner and I walk to all of the corners and back to where I started, that's the perimeter of my square. So they, I could say it's at side length plus at side length, right, four times, or I just multiply it by four. So the perimeter, if I want to return that value, I call the method. It will take whatever that instance's side length is, multiply it by 4, and return that value when I call it. So let's call uh, perimeters just so we differentiate them. I can say print out the value of my square and its perimeter and see how IntelliSense figures that out right away. So what would the, the perimeter of my square? 40, okay, very good. So the perimeter is 40. How about your square? All right, should be 80. So remember that each of these squares is what type of an object is my square? Is it a string? No. It's a square. It came from the square class that I just created here. So it's not a hash. It's not an array. It's not any of those. It's a square object. So because it's a square object, I can do square type stuff with it. And I can call the perimeter method. I can call the side length. Those are the things that I can do. Those are the behaviors of my square. And the data in my square is what? Remember that a class has both data and behavior. The data is what? State. The state, which is what value in here? In this square, what? Where, where am I storing the state? Side length, okay, so that's my data associated with my square. And I can have lots of data, but the square just doesn't need too much more. So that's, that's why it's a good one to start with. All right, so. I want you guys to think, how would I write a, a new method called area? We're thinking for a minute. <laughs> Let's. Okay, side length times side length. Uh, because the, this, the area of a square is the side times the side. It's a, the, the square of the square of the, of the side length. Right? That's pretty simple. So we're going to return the side length times side length. Right? We're going to multiply those two together. Or I could say side length to the second power, you know, squared. But this is easy. So I can, uh, I can now print out the, the uh, area of each of my squares. Yeah. And if I run that, I should get some different values. So I have 100 square whatever units are that I'm using, inches or miles or whatever. And my your square is 20 by 20, so it's 400 square whatever units I'm using. All right. So if I create a new, all of those methods are all based on the, how I instantiated the object or how I created a new object from my square class. So if I made this uh, 200 and ran it again, all of the only thing that changed was the instance variable for your square. So its perimeter is larger, and its square area is larger. It's 40,000 square whatevers, right? So my class now is a lot more useful it's got data associated with it and some methods to operate on that. And I've kept it all inside of this nice little package called a square class. And this makes your programming more clean by defining these attributes. You know exactly where a method goes. If I want to add some more behavior to my square class, I put a new method in my square class. 
so I can expand that. And then everybody else that might utilize my square class, the rest of the programmers on the team, can can get at this data and, and manipulate their squares this way. Right? So uh, any questions on that? Isn't that fun? Yeah. Did you have a question, Dad? All right. So let's move on to setters. It would be nice in, in our program as we're running to maybe modify some data that's inside the class. And when we do that, we want to change one of the attributes, change one of the data, change the state of our square object. So to do that, we do a setter. And usually this is done by, a, by uh, the same name again. I could call it whatever I want. I could call it Dave, but that's not so useful. If I create a, a method called side length equals, the equal sign actually becomes part of the method name. That becomes part of the method name. This is called side length equals. And then the value that I pass into it just like any normal method, is the value that I want to set. And I use that value to change the internal instance variable of that property. All right, so that's, that's all it is. And I'm going to store that data inside of the instance variable. So let's, let's go write that. I can just copy this. Copy. There we go. And we'll paste, we'll put our setter right next to our getter so we know where it is. And we have now side length equals, that's the name of the method. And then we're going to pass it in uh, a new value that's going to change the property of my square class, of that square object. All right, so even though my, my square has a, a side length of what after this statement is executed? Okay. 10, okay? I can change that now that I have a new method. I could say my square dot side length, and notice how we have an, a, a side length method without an equal sign and a side length method with an equal sign. So this one is the getter, and this one is the setter, all right? We're changing the value with the equal sign. We're assigning the value that we pass in into the instance variable, we're changing it. And the getter is just retrieving the current state, the current value of that instance variable. So we want the equal sign. And I'm going to change this now to be 5. All right? So that becomes, I don't have to have the equal sign right next to it. And in fact, I don't like that. Um, the, this is just like a normal assignment statement. I'm assigning 5 to side length. And what happens is that 5 comes into this method as the parameter that, get, get, that got passed. And that parameter then is going to be stuffed into my instance variable. So if I run this now, the, uh, the first time I print out this, the uh, side length here, it's 5 instead of 10. I initialized it to 10, but my program instantly changed it to 5. And so its parameter is now 20, and its area is 25. So I've changed the value of that instance of that class, square class. So I've set a new value for that property. So I can write as many of those as I want. I could write a getter and a setter for each value that I want to expose to the real world. Okay. See, I said they're a little more abstract. These are a little more abstract concepts. In, uh, in C Sharp, uh, Tom calls these business objects. These are the same thing as a business object in C, C Sharp. Um, it's a class. It's an object. They're the same thing. Any questions on that? Secure in what way? Yeah. 
it, a business object is not secure. <laughs> the security comes from how you use how you use it. It's not inherently built into creating a class. Even in C sharp, that doesn't automatically give you security. What you do is, what it does is, it encapsulates that data so that it's harder to change. It keeps it a little more separate from the rest of your program. You can't just arbitrarily change the, the, the size of my square. I have to call a method specifically on that object to change it. So in that way, it's, it's more secure, I suppose. I just never think of it that way. I'm, security must be imposed by something else on that object, not the object itself. I guess I'd have to understand what he's meaning by security in that case. All right, any questions on this? No? Come on, there's got to be something. Well, that's good. That's good. All right, so let's write a new object a new method to our class because if I just print out uh, my my square, remember what happened? My square, if I just printed it out to, by itself, at the end, I get this this gobbledygook. I know that it's a square object. It's got some address and memory, some I, local, some ID that I can find it. It's different than my other square, but that's not particularly useful. So if I wanted to, like our records for the, uh, the shirts and the prices, remember that? We printed out a record. Uh, we wanted to print out something that was useful. So we printed out the ID and the, the description and the price, right? We, we had to have information about that. So um, we could do that outside of the class by saying something like this. Um, uh, my square has a uh, side length of, and then how would I get the side length out of the my square object? Side length, all right. And an area of, how would I print the area of my my square? All right, so I can do that outside by utilizing some of this information. And it says my square has a side length of five and an area of 25. That's pretty cool, see? Um, but when we create objects like this, it's nicer to let the object describe itself. That's the whole idea of object-oriented programming. I might, that might be the way I always print out my squares. And so for my your square, I'd have to copy this and change my square to your square, right? This would be your, and this would be your square. So that I could see what my, what my your square, and, and uh oh, that changed. I'd have to change this. Your square has a side length of this. Okay, so um, to to get that, I get all the data out. But it would be nice if a an object could actually describe itself. All right, so we can write additional methods to our class that lets it print out its own representation of itself. All right, so we could take this same. Uh, or part of this string here, and put it inside of the class, and we'll create a method called 2s. Now, what is, uh, why do you think I'm calling it 2s? I'm going to represent a string. My square doesn't have a string representation yet, and so I can make a method that's by convention, a lot of all of the other methods are to use, and I just wanted to uh, change that. It's called overriding a method. We'll get to that later. But this is, uh, I want to return a string which represents that square. So 
I'm going to change this to this. This square has a side length of, now how do I get the side length now that I'm inside of my class? No. The at side length, right? All I have to do is get the this property of the class as an instance variable and use that to print it out. Whatever the state of this class is at this time, I mean this object, that'll be the value. And here, how would I print out the area? Okay, so this gets a little more complicated. An area is not an instance variable, so I can't do that. It's a method. Well, I already have a method for that. So I've, I've walked myself into a corner. I didn't want to get to this yet. Um, shoot. Yeah, you can write the method name, uh, but it has to call, that area has to call itself on something. Okay, I have to have something.area. And I didn't want to get into this. This is, to do this, we have to represent what, where are we inside of this class? We're inside of our self, right? We're inside of our self. So they use the word self to define that I'm inside of myself. So self represents whatever the object is that I'm inside of right now, and I call the area method on myself. This, right. This is used for JavaScript, and I, I think even uh, C Sharp uses that. So it's the same thing as this in other languages, so, but all right. So, so now when I call puts my square, let's see what happens. Let's, let's take these guys out. All right, so it says this square has a side length of 5, this square has a side length of 200, and an area of 4,000. So it's printing my nice little method there. And you notice that all I had to do was puts out the object itself. And the puts, by definition, calls the method 2s on whatever that object is. So my square, it's going to call the dot 2s method. That's implicitly implied. That's redundant. If I, as same thing as saying my square dot 2s, that returns a string. And that's why we don't do puts inside of our classes. If, if I did that, um, if I said puts, then it's going to call puts, puts, this square has a side length of, all right? So, yes, which is, which is bad, all right? Let's say I want to take the value of this uh, 2s and store it in a string that I want to do something else with later. Maybe I want to write this to a file. That, that puts is already writing it to a screen. So I want to make my class uh, putsless, right, and getsless. I don't, and there are, there are a few very rare occasions where I might write a, a class that has a puts and a gets in it, but very rarely. Uh, for instance, maybe the menu class might do that. Um, We'll, we'll write a menu class that is different than the one I gave you guys that's, that we can utilize from now on. All right, so that 2s now gets called whenever I call the puts my square. But I could also say I want to store that string in a variable, and I could say my square.2s, and then I could say puts a. So what type of variable is a? It's a string, very good, very good. And so when I say puts A, it's going to print the value of that. So there might be cases where I want to save that value and do something else with it rather than printing it to a screen. So that's why we don't use putses and getses. We want putsless and getsless classes. All right, any questions on any of this? We'll do lots more of this. Yeah, you can modify the original language. It, the language is written, yes, it's possible.
not practical, but it's possible. Yeah. Um, also, in just laying these things out, since I'm a big stickler for indentation, uh, notice how each of my methods has a blank line between them. So I don't like this. It's really kind of hard to see, right? I can't see where does my method change. It's really difficult. So don't do that. Brandon. Don't do that. And then uh, the rest of it should be the same way. I like to have spaces around my parentheses. That's, a, that's my own uh, idiosyncrasy. Uh, this is almost non-negotiable. I need to have spaces around my, my equal signs as well. A lot of people do this, and it starts to get too, too crunched, and I, I don't like that. That's interesting. This one has to be here because it's the name of the method. That distinguishes it as a, a what type of variable? Is it a getter or a setter? It's a setter, right? I'm setting a value inside. And the rest is just standard indentation. My methods are indented from my class. Everything inside my methods are indented again. And I can have lots of code inside each of these methods. I can have my own methods inside here. And these will get very big So as we, as we write these classes in the future. Any questions on that? All right, so let's uh, let's do one other fine. We got a couple minutes, and we can write this. And I was debating. Um, let's draw, create a method called draw our box. So, how did we draw a box last quarter? Tug a turtle. <laughs> no, we're not gonna have tug a turtle. We did it with uh, asterisks, right? So. The, the first thing was, and I'm going to do it as puts, and then we'll convert it to a string just to show you how we did that. We first created a, the first row was the size of the square, right, times uh, some character. So what's the size of, size of my square? At side length, the instance variable, side length. And that will print, I have one for the top, one for the bottom. And then inside I had a loop, remember that? You guys had to figure this out. We have a, a loop. Uh, we would probably do something like this. I might do it like this. Side length uh, minus, two. minus two dot times do. And this was, we would draw a, the first one, right, I would, in, inside of here I would do print, and then I would do a uh, plus some number of spaces, And a final period at the end. All right, let's see if that works. That looks like that's pretty good. So I can draw my square at the end by just saying uh, my square dot draw. Because the puts are inside the class, which is a no no, uh, that will actually draw it. Look at that, isn't that beautiful? Uh, so I have a problem, obviously. What did I miss? Right? I need to have a character turn at the end of this. So, or I can change this to a puts. Look at that. Isn't that a great square? It's like a rectangle. Hey, that's the, that's the resolution of the screen problem. So I could say, now I want to draw my your square dot draw, and it would draw a bigger square, right? It's going to draw a nice old huge one with 200, 200. Isn't that cool? 
So the square can draw itself on the screen if I want to by adding that method. So to make this not have puts in it, I have to create a string of all of this data and return the string instead of the put. So instead of that, I might have a, uh, a variable, we'll call it, I always have trouble with these, um, we'll call it draw string equals, and we're going to save that data into a string instead. And then every time we do something, instead of putting it, we're going to add that data to the string. We're going to add this stuff to the end of my string. And in this case, I need to have a slash n in here to, to represent the ending of each line. And instead of a puts, I'm going to say draw string. That's for in a puts directly. Um, and then we're going to do a, a plus equals. That's only if you're doing it directly from a puts, I believe. We'll see. We'll see what happens. All right. And so now draw string has here. And at the very end of my method, what happened? I lost something here. No, I guess that's right. At the very end, I want to return the value, and I like to explicitly do this, although most Ruby guys don't do this, Re explicitly return the value of my data. So now instead of draw, um, it's going to just do this. So what will happen? Nothing, because this returned a, a value, but I didn't do anything with it. So how do I get that to the screen now? I can put that. What's the what's the value of this entire representation? What type of variable? Right, it's a string because draw returns a string. There we go. Isn't that cool? So I've made my my uh, draw method not have any puts in it, and it just returns a string that I can do something with outside of my method, outside of my class. Isn't that awesome? So cool. All right, any questions?